in life. I think we could all agree it's a fairly common thing to seek happiness. It's in our culture, it's in our minds. We are taught this, especially here in Western culture where mere survival is not such a big thing. It's not so hard to survive. So we really have that as a focal point. It's kind of trained into us that that is a virtue pretty much to seek happiness. And whether you believe there's a creator or not, for the most part, I see, I've observed that most people want to find their happiness in the world, in the things of the world, in the people of the world, and, and pursuing the stuff, so to speak, that is here in this world. And the world is temporary, so you, you can find happiness to that extent. You will find happiness in temporary things. And there's this unspoken underlying knowledge of that. We all know this. We all know that it's going to go away. It's going to fade away. It's not going to be here forever. So like I say, the, the people who focus on that, whether they believe there's a creator or not, are aware of this reality. So we tend to cling to it. We cling to it and try to ignore that elephant in the room of there's something else, or at least I hope there is, because this is going away someday. So we ignore that. Usually it's the most common thing. I'm not observe and it appears to me a lot of people tend to not want to focus on the reality of that. So we'll hang on to some something we have or something we once had and hope that we can get it again. This thing we thought was happiness with, with this one circumstance or person or situation or or collection of circumstances and situations and persons or whatever it was we had hoping we can get it and or keep it when we all know deep down it's all temporary no matter what. And then there's God. Then there's the Creator. And that's the thing that, that changes your life. So I guess in a way you could say this, this will be something of a testimonial, but not, not my story as it were, but a testimonial as far as what the Creator can do in your heart. The, the nature of His eternality. I, I haven't looked that up yet to find out if that's a word. I used it before. Eternality as opposed to the temporal nature of all the things in the world. And they're wonderful. The things in the world are fine. I love the things in the world. I love people. And, I'm, and, and this is why I want to talk about this, is because I'm learning how to appreciate those things and people and all of it more, little by little. It's a process. Because of my appreciation for them for what they are as temporal and my God for who He is as eternal. My understanding of those things in the proper place is what's giving me this peace. So that's the general thrust of a lot of the messages or things we talk about here is simply understanding the difference between the Creator and the creation. Because that gives you great peace. And it's not about performance. It's not about discipline, as in the way religion will teach you. It's about di discipline, about denying yourself, things like that. Denying yourself is something that comes out in all kinds of ways that you don't want it to, to happen. And although a person who is drawing closer to God because they are seeing Him, and, and loving Him more according to their understanding of who He is, it can look like a person who is in denial, as in denying themselves, denying their flesh, but that's not what their focus is. They're not thinking like that. They are in pursuit of their happiness. They are in pursuit of their joy. So I want to share a scripture here where David speaks about that, and he, if, you, if you can understand, or Consider, I want to say understand, I don't want to be condescending to anyone, but just consider what I'm saying is it really is about 
having your eyes open. That's why the word revelation is used so much. Unfortunately, it's usually used in regards to prophesying the future or something like that. Whereas revelation, the most important aspect of it is having your God, the person of your God, revealed to you. Because that is what changes you. It changes the very inner being of who you are. Seeing who He is changes who you are. This is not some sort of academic exercise. It's not philosophy. It is supernatural. That is what happens when you see who He is. So we just encourage you to seek that because once you get a taste of that and you see the eternal nature of it, that even though you are changed, you have an endless change that is going to continue on forever, at least in this life, and I imagine into the next. It will be quite different. I don't know what it's going to be like. All I know is that now I am being changed day by day. Like I said earlier, my appreciation for things as they are, the temporal and the eternal, is increasing all the time. And I'm able to love people and appreciate life and appreciate just the everyday ordinary things and even the frustrating things. Not because it's my duty, not because it's a command, but because my heart is really being changed and I'm seeing those situations, people, places, and things and all that in a different way, in a way that my eternal God sees things. I'm seeing through His eyes as He is also seeing through, my, through mine and hearing through His ears and He hears through mine. It's the relational part of it that changes that changes your very being. So, I go to Psalm 16, starting in verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I have set the Lord always before me, just basically saying, He has God on His mind. And David's dramatic, and this might be literal. Maybe the Lord was always in the front and center of His mind. I don't know when he wrote this, but there are certain things that happen in his life that seem to indicate the Lord was always not always at the front of his mind. This is poetry, though. So I don't take it like, oh, David didn't do what he said he did because he is not always at the front of my mind. But, as, as I said earlier, it's a process more and more every day. And that's the way it's designed. It's designed to be that way. I couldn't just go from being consumed with the world and the things in it and my goals for happiness through it to just focusing on God 100%. He allows for that. He designed it that way. So we can first catch a glimpse of Him and then develop a little bit of a thirst or a hunger and want to see more and want to see more and want to see more. And that's not a confusion or a contradiction where He says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Those are two separate statements, basically. That's a spiritual thing, the first half. I've set the Lord always before me. And then he says, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. At my right hand is just a position of authority. That's what that, I shouldn't say just. It is simply a position of authority. The Lord has authority in his life. The Lord has authority in his heart so that he shall not be moved. That the things of the world come against him, the terrors, the fears, the worries, the concerns, and even the pleasures, even the positive stuff. And he's saying, I will not be moved because the Lord is before me and I have placed him at my right hand. In other words, I trust him. I have trusted him to do what only he can do, to move in my heart as only he can move. That the world cannot do those things. Verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. He's talking about how when he dies, he knows he can die in peace. He knows he can rest in hope, knowing that there's something more than this temporal world. There's something more than this, because he has placed the Lord in front of him, in his mind, and his thoughts, and he knows that this is not all there is. The one who made all of this is all that there is. That's the one who is, who is that individual, that person is all that is.
so he can rest in that, knowing that he knows this one. Verse 10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So you see, he doesn't really explain in detail. Maybe he got so deeply in his spirit, he didn't feel the need to explain it. But it's explained further by Peter in chapter 2 of the book of Acts when he quotes this. But he says, you will not leave my soul in Sheol. It's another word for hell or the grave. And he's confident of this. He knows because the Lord is before him. The Lord is at his right hand. The Lord is the one who takes care of him. He will not be moved. In other words, he will not be moved out of the kingdom of his God. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And that's a prophecy of the Lord himself when he would come here as the Lord Jesus. 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. And that's where... I wanted to focus on that last part. You will show me the path of life. So he's talking at a time before the Lord could actually dwell within us. I'm sure David experienced many amazing things that I will never experience, but the Lord did not dwell inside of him. So he prophesied, you will show me the path of life. He is showing us the path of life. That is, those of us who have put our faith in him, who have him living within us. In your presence is fullness of joy. That fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures evermore. That is the eternal. That is the nature of it. It's not about pursuing these temporal things. It's about appreciating the temporal things. And understanding where they come from. Because he's the one who gives them. And it's the joy that we just cannot explain. It's okay to pursue happiness. Understand that. We've all done it. Every single one of us has done it. It's part of life. It's what we have to go through to find out that it can't be found in this world. And to say that it's at his right hand and in his presence is not to say that in a building is where you get it. And that's where the problem comes in. Where people think this because it's translated to them in that way. They think that, oh... I got to go in a building. Oh, I must do these religious things. Oh, I must behave in these religious ways. I must dress in this religious way. I must speak in these religious terms for those things to happen. And then I look at all the glassy-eyed people that claim it, and I just think, I don't want it. Well, I totally relate to you. Let me just tell you that. That is not where it's at. And I always wondered, my wife and I both wondered, where is that joy? I know it's around the corner. Sometimes I feel a glimpse of it. Sometimes I think I saw it. Sometimes I got enough people around me shouting and screaming and hollering and crying and weeping and rolling around the floor that I can almost convince myself that it's here, but it never really is. It still goes back to that undercurrent, that underlying reality that we just don't want to face, that it's just not happening. It's not here. I'm not getting it. I'm getting something temporary. So religion, to that extent, offers basically the same thing that the world offers. It offers you something temporary. And there's something that God alone can offer you. That's why I want to go back to that verse. You will show me the path of life. Well, he is the path of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In your presence is fullness of joy. To be in his presence is the thing, like I said earlier, that changes you it changes you it's not through studying the bible it's not through getting in the right study in the right building in the right denomination under the right teacher it's getting in his presence it's a submission it's a surrender it's a letting go of all the things that you do that you don't even know you do that you in your own way are religious about that you will not let go of because you fear or you just believe that unless you do things this way, things will not work out. That is a common thing that we all share. That we, we all have our own form of this. Wherever we developed it. Through all kinds of influences. From the culture. From family. From teachers. From books. All kinds of things. And we've developed our own set of rules. Of the things we must do. In order to get what it is that we want. 
It's a human thing. It's part of the human condition. And what God asks you to consider is that He is the only one who can provide these things. It's not all that. He gave you those things, again, for your enjoyment, for your amusement, for your appreciation, but not to the edifying of your soul, not to the fulfilling of your heart that you would realize that you are loved and accepted perfectly. You have someone who loves and accepts you perfectly and he provides those things, but he is not those things. Those things are not him. So when he says, in your presence is fullness of joy, it's the most simple thing in the world. In his presence, he is everywhere. Since the day of Pentecost, he poured out his spirit over all flesh and he is here. And he is available. And I know that can sound scary. It definitely sounded scary to me when I was in religion. Because their, their description of it did mean doing something. Something I did not know how to do. But yet I was commanded to do it. And there was the double mindedness which was that God will do it. You can't do it. But you must do it. And it just goes along with all the other double minded things that religion has to offer. And that's exactly how it was. You must do this, but you can't do it. Only God can do it, but make sure you do it. And it was just confusion. As opposed to the simplicity that is in Christ, the reality that here he is, I'll be in his presence. It's not something I measure. It's not something anyone is going to measure. You're in his presence when your heart calls out to him, when your heart seeks him. When you truly want to know who he is. That is not something that should be quantified. That should be measured. As if you are enough. Or not enough. Or, or more than enough. Or whatever it is people want to tell you. You are in his presence when you begin that search. When you really seek for him. It happens right in that moment. Right then and there. That's when the change begins to happen. Because it's a heart thing between two individuals. You and him. And there is no other trappings, there is no other window dressing, there is no other things you need to do. The plan of salvation and all that. Yes, there is one God and He alone is God and that's Jesus. And there are not a million ways to Him, but there's countless people who are individuals who will find Him in their own individual way. But they seek Him and He relates to you as an individual. And you will find him, the individual, through your own seeking, not as instructed by someone else. It's good to understand some basic rudiments about who he is. And they are basic. He is the creator. He is the only one that's good. He came here and gave himself for you. Even if you're not sure about these things, you can still seek them by asking him. And I know that it takes a certain amount of humility because it's awkward. It's strange. It is to talk to an invisible person, even if it's just in your mind or in your heart, you don't say the words out loud, it's still strange. I can relate to that. Do it the way you're comfortable with. If you're only comfortable with speaking in your mind, that's fine. Because he knows the thoughts of our minds. It's the condition of your heart that matters. Because if you think, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do because Joe, the religious guy down the street, said do it this way and you'll know God then again, I'm going to get that temporal thing. I'm going to get something that's based on man's understanding. And I don't want that. I want the creator. I want the answer that begins to take away all this emptiness, all this vanity, all this, this unspoken elephant in the room that we all know is there, that we're all relying on something that is going away. You want to have something that you know is not going away. And this is the way to do it. It's by trust. And even if you don't trust, you can seek trust by asking these questions of who he is. And to finish that verse, At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Forevermore. That is true. And again, just to finish, I want to connect it to what it's done to my wife and I. There are miracles happening in our lives. And they are not miracles that will, will be written of in books and people will look at it like the parting of the Red Sea or the healing of lepers or the opening of blind eyes. But they, 
they are just as great, if not more so, because our blind eyes have, have been opened, our blind spiritual eyes that we could not see, literally we could not see. We could not see the things of God. We could not see the person of God, the individual of our God, the love and acceptance that He had for us. And now our eyes have been opened. And all of it, all the sickness, all the disease, all the leprosy of our spirit has been removed by Him. We still have this physical body, and it is temporal. And we have an eternal connection with our God. And that gives us such a peace that when we come into problems, we confront problems, we can now enter into that situation with a peace that says, it's going to be figured out, and even if we don't personally figure it out, it's still going to be okay, because we're with the one who understands all things. And we can ask him, and if he tells us, then we, we can be confident he will make it in a way that we will understand. And if he doesn't, apparently we don't need to know. We don't have to worry about it. The thing that, that we have, though, that's giving us this peace is that connection with Him. And it's not related to anything that any man tells you to do. And I just wanted to go to that one word forevermore. This is a, a really cool word, the description or the definition of it. It says, properly a goal, that is, the bright object at a distance traveled towards. Hence, figuratively, splendor, or subjectively, truthfulness, or objectively, confidence. Continually, that is, to the most distant point of view, always, constantly. The thing is, we have that insight, and that bright thing, the bright object at a distance traveled towards is with us as we go towards it. As we go towards Him, He is with us, carrying us home to Himself. So it's, it encompasses both ends of that. That's where we're at. We are in the light and traveling to the light. And that might sound like a paradox, but it's not because the light lives within us. It's just that we are not in heaven itself at this moment, but we have the confidence of knowing that heaven is in us. Because that's the whole thing. It's, it's not so much, I'm borrowing a phrase here from Aaron Budgen, and, and I may not say this perfectly right, but he says it's not about getting you out of hell and into heaven. It's about getting him out of heaven and into you. And once that happens, life has changed. It is. It's just different. Everything is different. So we encourage you to seek that because once that happens, you're never going to go back. You won't want to. He won't let you. And that's all there is to it. It's just a different life. And that's what being the new creation is all about. And God bless us all in Jesus' name.